Turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Well, I might just stay here and preach a little while. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For either hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. Who when He was revived, revived not again. When He suffered, He threatened not, but committed Himself to that justice righteously who his own self bore our, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were a sheep going astray, but now return unto the shepherd and the bishop of your soul. I want you to realize what Christ done back in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Listen to what it tells us about that Jesus looked and thought about for the joy that was set before Him. He endured the cross. What joy could there possibly be in a cross? If I have just a moment, if I'll take just a moment this morning, I want to remind you of the sacrifice that Christ sacrificed for me and you. He could have called legions of angels to deliver to Him in a moment and yet they stood there mocking Him him and cast it in his teeth. They plucked his beard from his face. They placed a crown of thorn upon his head. They had beaten his back to a bloody pulp. They took his arms and they stretched him upon a cross and they nailed nails in his hand and in his feet and they stood that old cross up with a thud in the ground as the flesh ripped in his back rubbed upon the cross. Think of the pain and the agony that he hung between heaven and earth that day. It was not his Sins. It was not his sins. It was my sins. For he had done no wrong. Thank each agonizing breath that Christ breathed on the cross. He had to pull himself up. The Romans were cruel torturers and they would so hang an individual that in order for them to get air into their lungs they would have to pull themselves up and eventually they would no longer they would get so weak they could no longer pull themselves up and they would hang there and they would suffocate that's why they would come around later and they would break the legs when they were ready for them to die and they could no longer pull themselves up they no longer could support themselves so they could draw air into their lungs and they would suffocate but we find Jesus Christ each agonizing breath that he breathed had to pull himself up on that cross where is the joy in that? Me and you know what sin's all about. A lot of people preach that Jesus will save you in your sins. I'm glad that's not the truth. I'm glad, Brother Robert, He come to save me from my sins. Because I know what sin feels like. I know how horrible and how awful it is. I know how it separates you from God. The awful feeling that sin is in your heart and your life. Oh yeah, there's pleasure in sin, but it's only for a moment. And sin brings death day by day and moment by moment. And sin eventually brings its work forth. And I'm thankful that, that He has eradicated it and changed my life and saved me from my sins. But Christ had never knew sin. He had never knew sin. He was God incarnate. When He came down and He took the form of man, He was God and He was man. When He made Himself a little lower than the angels and He came and He took on the form of man, He had never known sin. He lived a spotless life on this earth without sin. If He sinned, we would still be dead and our trespasses and in our sins. But glory be to God, He lived a spotless, holy life led by the Holy Ghost of God so that He could be that perfect sacrifice eyes. But see the greatest torment that Christ suffered. How could there be any joy in this? 
Explain that to me. How could there be any joy? The greatest torment that Christ suffered was yet to come when the weight of the sins of the world was placed upon Him. He never knew sin. Never knew what it felt like. Never knew. And all at once, all of our sins was dropped on Him. Listen as he cries out in the greatest agony that he's cried since he's been hung on the cross and he cries, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? I don't care how many preachers stand behind how many pulpits today and and they're godly or so-called godly and righteous robes and tells people they can sin and God will have fellowship with them. God will not, God cannot, never has and never will have fellowship with sin. And as Christ took my sins and your sins and nailed it to His cross, the Father had for that moment to turn His head. And Christ felt the separation. He felt the sin of the world upon Him with such agony. And the reason He was willing to bear it was He looked down in 2012 and He saw me and He saw you and He was willing to bear it. What is the joy? One of the things that that helps my mind to grasp on to this, and I'll not even claim to know the agony that childbirth brings. I've sat outside while my sister-in-law, out in the waiting room, I don't know how far away she was, but I could hear her. She'd kill me if y'all tell her. But I knew that was as close as I ever wanted to get to childbirth. For nine months you carry that child, the heat, the cold, and you suffer. And you do everything for that child. If you're sick, you don't take no medicine. Whatever. Whatever you can do for that child. And you know at the end of that nine months that there is the worst pain that that can even begin to be imagined is coming. But there is a joy. There's a glow, is there not? There's a joy about a true mama who loves that baby. Where is the joy? It's because, you know, after all that suffering, after all that pain, the child is going to come forth. Christ saw the cross, but I'm thankful to God, Brother David, that He looked beyond the cross. I'm thankful He looked beyond and He saw the children that would be born into the kingdom of God. And to Him it was joy to hang between heaven and earth and to suffer as no one has ever suffered before because He knew that sons and daughters would be born into the kingdom of God. He knew there was no other way whereby I might be saved. He knew there was no other way to pull me out of the depths of hell and bring me home to be with Him but that He would hang there and suffer for my sins. Well, glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He bore our sins. He tells us here in 2 Peter verse 24 in His body that we might live unto righteousness. On the cross He reached up and He got the hand of God. And he reached down and he got the hand of man. And he brought us back together again. I'm so thankful on that day as Christ hung between heaven and earth that the hand of God reached down. And he got a hold of that veil that had separated man for so long. And he ripped it in twain. And now Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior is that veil so that we can enter into the very presence of God and there have fellowship with Him. I don't care, glory to God. I don't care how many people tell you there are other ways to be saved. You hear me now. You can't get good enough to be saved. I've had a lot of people say, oh, I'll start coming to church. When I can live it, you'll never come to church because you can't live it. There must be a cleansing that takes place. There must be a change in your life and in your heart. And that is only through the cross. It is not through any actions that you do in yourselves. It is by His grace, by faith, believing, by looking unto Jesus Christ, the author, the one who starts this faith, the one who begins this faith, the one who starts us on the way. And there is no other way. 
Paul spoke and he said the preaching of the cross is foolishness to this world. You hear me and you hear me well this morning. I know this ain't popular, but it's true. I want you to realize if you listen to ministers, a lot of time on the television, see how many mention the cross. Now if I get on your program, forgive me. No, I don't really. Start paying closer attention. They don't mind preaching prosperity. I believe God prospers His people. But if they don't preach the cross, there's no prosperity. If they don't mention the blood, Brother Doug, that's an old message. You better believe it. It's old and wonderful and true and everlasting. It has stood and will continue to stand the test of time. Man have tried to destroy it. Man have tried to tear it down. Man have tried to make it stop. But you'll never stop that precious blood flow that flows from Calvary. Glory be to God. It flows way down unto the lowest valley. And it flows up to the highest mountain, the cross of Jesus Christ. See, it stands at the forefront of the church. And if we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, it will be with the cross they don't mind preaching prosperity they don't mind preaching healing it's because of the cross by his stripes we are healed everything as a child of God revolves around the cross of Calvary let man call it foolish let man call it crazy but I'm thankful for the cross of Christ that see it stands and I look to Jesus the author and the finisher of my faith now this might not be popular neither or politically correct I don't really care You want to know why they want to take the crosses down? Because they know what it stands for. Oh no, brother Doug, you know we got to be we got to be tolerant. We got to be this and that. Not me, I'll lift the cross up as high as I can because it is. It is what will save man's soul from hell. I don't do it out of hatefulness, I do it out of love. I lift the cross of Calvary up because I know that ground is level and I don't care what nationality, what color, what creed, whatever they might be, that ground is level. And if they'll come to the cross, they stand on level ground with anybody else because He still saves and He still cleanses those who will come and those who will believe in Him. Thank God for the cross of Calvary. And I still believe in that wonderful cross. 